interesting introduction. Uh, many tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of students in the middle school years are failing at numeracy and literacy schools in Australia. This is a, um, a real concern and it has a, cumul a cumulative effect on these kids that resonates all through all their actions. They don't say, if you talk to them, they don't say, oh, I'm, I'm a failure at school and I fail every day. What they say is, it's not really for me, this sort of stuff. And I'm not, I'm not, very, good at this, I'm not very good at it. I'll probably never be ever very good at it. National data also suggests that, um, it come out in the last couple of years, that something like 50% of adults in employment don't have the necessary numeracy, literacy or problem solving skills to participate in training programs so that they would get the most out of them or to work most effectively in their current position that they're in. Now this sort of data is very compelling. And the two questions, I guess, that are sitting in your mind is, how can we do something to stop this so that it doesn't um, happen in the future? And the second question, which is related in a sense, what can we do to those people that are already in the system and uh, how can we help them? The answers to both these questions, there are commonalities in the answers, but my talk today is about the second one. It's about what can we do for people who are currently see themselves as failing or are not achieving, say, national benchmarks for children or the needs of their job in terms of adult, what can we do to actually help them? The answers um, to these questions are very significant, I believe, for our nation. In 2001, a colleague and myself won a small federal grant um, to work with what I've referred to as at-risk children in, a, one, in two schools. One was primary and one was secondary. And we were able to work for a year with 12 students in each school. This year, um, this program, which now we now call QuickSmart, is being offered in 950 schools across the country and something like 15,000 students are actually undertaking the program. We're also working with adults in prisons in corrective services to see that if, if knowing more about basic numeracy literacy can have an impact on recidivism skills. And we're also working in pre-employment and employment programs again with adults in industry. The idea of the program is to offer a second chance to uh, these at-risk learners so that they can um, set themselves challenging goals and actually have a meaningful work for life uh, in the future. If you're sitting there thinking, I, I might just give a quick example. One of the things in this program, we use flashcards, which has been around for many thousands of years. And I have principals ring me and say that a child got one extra flash. They have to get so many flashcards in a certain time. And they said a, a child will get one extra flashcard and the teachers and the, and will comment that that person walks around on cloud nine all day. You might be happy about that, but you have to ask yourself a deeper question. What must there be in their educational life if one piddly flashcard can actually turn around how that person feels about themselves for a whole day? Today I want to explore this issue um, and take things that I've learnt from the 13 years that we've been working on this program, but also Pauline, which was the basis for the program, research on cognition and from neuroscience. And I want to share with you six um, big ideas, I think, that I'd like to lead, take, that you take, and if you're a parent with children yourself or if you've got colleagues who you feel in that situation, might give you some understanding of the plight that they're in, but also in maybe a way in which you can maybe support them. Okay, first three things I want to talk about, as you can see on the overhead, neural networks, working memory and long-term memory. And what I see these as is that if we are going to try and help people with severe learning difficulties, then we actually need to do it in a context of neural reality. 
So the first thing about neural networks, it's a quite an interesting question, is from a brain perspective, how does learning actually work? How does it actually work as from the brain? Well, the brain is actually made up of 10 to the power 11 neurons or nerve cells. That's a very big number. That's one with 11 noughts after it. And each one of those neurons can, has the possibility of linking with something like 10,000 other neurons. So when you, these numbers are sort of really beyond our comprehension about the possibilities that exist within our brain. So when we talk about learning, what it's really about is that a neuron um, connects um, over a small gap with another neuron and sends a uh, electrochemical impulse, if you like, across that gap. And then that neuron connects with another neuron, which are lots of other neurons. And, over, and as this process continues, we end up with a neural network or neural pathway. And when that neural network or pathway is activated, that's what a memory is, that's what a concept is, that's what an idea is. So learning is about developing these neural networks. It was Donald Hebb, uh, a Canadian psychologist back in 50s, 1949 actually, where he, he hypothesised that if we had two neurons and one excited the other, and we did it um, for a while, so we did it on a number of occasions, the efficiency between those two neurons increased. And it became famous, it's called Hebb's Law, and the law states that if two new neurons fire together, over time they will wire together. And it sort of reminds me like when we, if, if you, I haven't done this, but walk through a jungle. Um, the first time you walk through, it's really hard going, you would be cutting your pathway. The second time would be a little bit better on the same path, but not quite so good. Then as you did it over and over, you become far more efficient at working along that path. This is what happens in our brain. And it's interesting, just as an aside, it wasn't until the 1970s, over 20 years later, that the actual evidence of what um, Hebb thought would happen actually did happen. So when we look at what learning is, it's the creation in our brain of these neural networks or pathways with all the different things that we know. The next thing I want to talk about is working memory. Actually, it's working memory capacity. Working memory is not a place in your brain. It's not a spot when we do fMRI scans and said that's the spot for working memory. It's actually a theoretical construct. What, although I must say that this, um, in terms of uh, a lot of the working memory, this front part of our brain, prefrontal cortex, does light up on the fMRI scans, but it's generally right across the brain. The big thing about working memory, however, is that it's, the capacity is finite. And because it's nowhere in the brain, I get away with using my hands like this. So there's just so much working memory we have available to us. And interestingly, that doesn't change much over our life. And it's not that different from human being to human being as well. It's sort of like a gateway into our brain. And you could probably think about evolutionary reasons why that might be the case, that um, people who are actually able to focus on a number of small things are, better, are more likely actually to um, survive than someone who's maybe looking at the flowers when a, a lion is attacking them and enjoying everything. Um, you could probably see there could be some evolutionary advantage in that. And you will feel it in every day in all your life. If I was to sit here and give you 10 numbers at random or 10 letters at random, practically nobody in the room would be able to give those back to me. And that's why if you think if I were to ask you your mobile number, you would probably give it to me in terms of you know, a clump of numbers, then a few numbers, then another clump of numbers. That's the, um, what the brain does in terms of um, chunking information together. The famous example is Miller in the 50s where he suggested that seven was the magic number and you probably would have all heard of the seven plus or min minus two bits of information. But some people, of course, once that was said, everybody came in with different numbers. And so on, some are three, some say four. It's very complicated. I don't want to go down that pathway. But what I do want to say is that what it's saying is it's clearly finite. 
You might be sitting there asking yourself, if that's true, if it is finite, how is it that I can do so much more now than I could when I was young? And it comes back to that notion of chunking. What, what our brain does over time with practice and experience, it chunks things together. And so rather than letters, we chunk them into words. And so they, instead of the letters each taking up one of these elements, a word takes up that le uh, element. Then as we do more work, we get sentences can take up that element and not so much the letter. And it still leaves us with that much working space. So that's the reason we can do uh, so much with working memory. So when we talk about learning, we really need to think about what sort of working memory demands are we placing on students and people, and particularly at at-risk learners. And so sometimes trying to be very helpful and giving people a lot of help and a lot of support is the very thing that their brain can't cope with. They cannot simply cope with all this input. Okay, the third thing I want to talk quickly about is long-term memory. Long-term memory is where uh, information resides that is relatively stable and uh, it's where our memories, and so when they're activated, the, uh, the neural pathways that, are, that we've practised on for a while, when we activate them, that's how we get to know songs and concepts and ideas. This notion of uh, materials in long-term memory is very important and if the, neural path, if the neural connections are efficient, then it, it is very handy. Um, it links a whole lot of information together. It also means that um, once we've got things in long-term memory, we don't tend to forget them. <clears throat> now, you might think, well, there's a lot of things I forget. There is some recent research, and only very recent, where at the fringes that, that, that forgetting does seem to be the, re the removal or the change of these neural connections. But for most of our um, things that we're wanting to talk about, once the neural pathways are established, you're stuck with them. If they're good ones, that might be nice. If they're not so good ones, you're stuck with them as well. And what, when we talk about forgetting, what actually happens is our brain has trouble finding it. Now, I've had experiences, and I would think all of you have had experiences. It happens to me often in the car that I'll be driving along and the announcer will announce some song and I say, oh, I used to like that song. I used to be able to sing it, but I can't remember any of the words. I can remember the, how it sounds, but I can't remember the words. And then a few minutes later, the song comes on, I hear the chords, and all of a sudden I start singing all the words, which excites the people, the passengers in the car. And, and they think I'm amazing that I can remember things 30, 40 years ago. What I needed was the catalyst or that sort of activation to activate it. That memory was still there. And so it's a very, that, there's a possibility that that's evolutionary too, that, uh, that those people that actually had important things lie down in their working memory, they just couldn't turn it off. And so you could think that those people who had developed really important ideas if, if it was such that the brain could just get rid of them easily, then that would be a problem. But as I said earlier, if you've got um, difficult neural pathways, that's the wrong word, unfortunate, that's the wrong word, if you've got something uh, wrong with neural pathway and you've been practising that, then you're stuck with it. And in the case of these people with low literacy and numeracy skills, in the case of numeracy, it might be that they use very effortful strategies they might actually use their fingers to actually work out basic sums. Where I say to you 5 plus 7, you would say to me 12. You're actually using up a very small amount of your working memory and you've got this much less to access other material. If you were to use your fingers and working out 5 plus 7, you would actually use that much of your working memory and you would have a very little bit left to actually get on and do other activities. And so if you're confronted with learners that have got these effortful neural, neural pathways established then, and that's stuck there, then the only answer to the problem is, you might get, try to guess, and the answer is you have to develop another set of neural pathways. And so that's going to take quite considerable time. 
I want to talk about three more things, holy smoke, three more things um, very quickly, very, very quickly. Automatistic deliberate practice and valuing errors. Those three things link in with the things that I've talked about before. In the first one, automaticity, it's being able to say things very quickly. When I say to you, five plus seven, you say 12, there was no real thinking going on. The value of that is that it uses up so little working memory and you've got so much space. So if you think about basic fundamental skills, if, if you didn't have automaticity on those skills, then your working memory just about done its job before once you've got through that, so the chance to go on and do higher order functioning just isn't available to you. The second one is deliberate practice. I'm thinking of tennis, and I, I don't know why people don't look at sport to see the differences with education. If you were playing tennis and you had trouble serving, is it going to help you to be a better server if you go and play more games of tennis? And the answer is yes, probably about that much, which means not much. What would be more important is to go out of the game and have someone there to support you and encourage you, but actually give you advice and actually deliberately practice the serve. And so that when you came back into the game, you could do so, you could play a much better game. And thirdly, the valuing of errors. It's a real pity to me that our education system focuses on how many things do we get right, when what the real focus should be on is errors. And again, this has an evolutionary take if you want to go down that pathway. Those people that made mistakes, or their ancestors who made mistakes, thought about their mistakes, reacted to those mistakes and made changes to their life, are more likely to survive and have children and so on. This notion that errors are actually critical, you might not be aware of it, but in the centre of our brain there's a part that lights up every time we're confronted with a mistake or an error. So our brain is specifically focusing on what errors are. And it's called the anterior cingulate cortex, ACC, and it's a very special thing. So our brain is geared to take account of errors. And so if you're working with someone, you should be saying things like, if you don't make an error or mistake today, and we haven't had a chance to work it through, then this lesson has not been very successful. It just means we've just confirmed that you know what you know, but we haven't gone in. And because you haven't done that, you actually haven't gone into the deeper thinking that's needed. And we really want to set up a, 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 an environment where people are willing to take risks in their education and their learning and where errors is a possibility, but it's one to be um, admired and, and thought well of rather than discouraged. My final conclusion I put up there. I'd like to leave as a challenge to you to see learning through neural realities, to see learning in that way. And I believe that if you do that, students can experience genuine improvement and success in meeting important benchmarks. They could want to strive because once they get that success, success breeds success is very true. They want to strive to do more and it has to come from within. A good teacher is one that helps a student want to be better, want to learn more. And it would need to exert the necessary effort, deliberate practice and persistent needed to achieve these challenging goals. So my view is that I'd like you to leave here, and many of you may think this way already, no one needs to fail. And neural realities, if we build that into our programs, then learners have hope and a new way to proceed. Many thanks.